Hello? Can you hear me? You can? Perfect. Okay, that means I, I sort of tend to move a lot when I'm talking, and, and this is going to be a problem. So, um, first up, first up, I should start by going, who am I? A lot of you have heard this already because I've been lecturing here over the last couple of days. So sorry if this is a repeat. But I thought it's worth explaining who I am. My name is Stee Curran. Uh, Stee is short for Stephen. It was a normal name in the small part of England where I was growing up. It's not anywhere else. So I spend most of my time explaining that. Uh, I used to be a writer straight from university. I went to work for Edge magazine, which is a pretentious video game magazine for adults, theoretically. And that's where I learnt to love video games again um, and learnt what video games could be. From Edge, I went to work at a studio called Zoe Mode via a short, short stint in production at Sony. Uh, Zoe Mode is a studio in uh, Brighton and was in San Francisco and in London as well. Uh, and there I was creative director. If you don't know what creative director is, creative director is basically the annoying person who oversees everything. My job was going and looking at projects and saying, oh, um, I think that looks great, but it could do with a little bit more green. Anyway, see you in three weeks. Really annoying. Hard to do that and not be a dick. Did my best. Uh, Stopped that a few years ago. Now I am a designer. I work on my own video games. I'm building some small things that I love. I'm a consultant. I work with a lot of brilliant studios across the world. Go in, look at the thing that they are trying to make, look at the thing that they are making, and try and make those things closer together. What else am I? I'm a lecturer, so I do stuff like this as well, and I'm a presenter. I have a radio show called One Life Left, which I don't advise you listen to, but it does exist. Um, I also play a lot of games. I always have, ever since I was a kid. Um, I've loved games, like they, they've been a huge, huge part of my life. Uh, growing up in the 80s, I played an awful lot of things. Some people struggling to get in the room or trying to sneak past, I can't work it out. Um, so love games, I've seen trends come and go. I've seen them emerge, I've seen them die again. I've watched video gaming change completely from what I knew as a kid to what it is now. And I've watched it also kind of, I've watched an interesting change. I've watched it drive a lot of people away and now start to grab people in. I think gaming is such an exciting place to be right now. You can create anything, and I mean you can create anything. Today's, uh, talk is going to embrace some of the things that Mika talked about just then. Um, but I want to start in a slightly different way by reading something that I wrote called The Queen. Um, this is a, a short story, and it's super, super important to me. I think it's one of my favorite things that I've ever written. And I think it's also completely relevant to what we're going to talk about. While I'm doing this, I probably won't pace around because it, it's important that I get it right, so I'm going to stay here. Actually, no, I'm going to move around. I've changed my mind. Okay, this is called The Queen. I glance at the clock. It is a little after midnight. The Queen, not the Queen, but another Queen, my Queen, sits on the edge of a cedar chair by the dressing table in her bedchamber, waiting for the knock on the door. When will it happen? Tonight or tomorrow morning or perhaps the day after that, but she knows it will come. And when it does, she will rise to open the door and the man on the other side will hang back in the shadows, fearful, shaken. And as he steps forward into the flickering light, he will bow his head, typically out of respect but also because he cannot look her in the eye. She will bite her lip because she will want to say, I know, I already know. But that is not how this story goes. And besides, before she can, Mom, he will say, I'm sorry to disturb you, Mom, but the king, 
He's. In that trailing sentence, her world will collapse. Her scream will bounce from the stone walls of the fortress, a raw primal choke that is both guttural and piercing, unforgettable, infinite. All air and life drain from within her. Her stomach will buckle and she will fold inwards to the floor like an unhung tapestry. Somewhere a button has been pressed that turns light into dark. All of their dreams, the plans they made and the stories they have written dissolve to fiction and the future falls away, dragging the past in its slipstream. It is not just that there is nothing, but, that, but it is as if there has never been anything. There is just here, just this, just darkness, loneliness, forever. That's the future. For now, she sits and she waits for the knock. It will come. And all I can do is watch. Dwarf Fortress is a treacherous game. It's a video game like no other. An independent project developed by Tarn Adams, a lone coder who considers the game his life's work. It simulates the world for a group of dwarves whose aim is to build a permanent settlement in a high fantasy wilderness. It's a mixture of SimCity, Dungeon Keeper, NetHack, Microsoft Excel, and unfathomable magic and excruciating mental pain. Dwarf Fortress is also a lonely game, not just because the dwarves, your dwarves, begin isolated in the middle of nowhere. As with Minecraft, they have to immediately craft a temporary first home from the environment before that same environment kills them, but because it leaves the player utterly isolated too. Isolated by design, isolated by the interface, and isolated by the aesthetic. Isolated by design, you don't have direct control over your dwarves. You can issue commands, you can order them to go to a certain task or location, and in theory at least, these commands will be obeyed according to a hierarchical tree of jobs and priorities. In truth, this system is at best obstructive, at worst impenetrable, and you are at the mercy of your dwarves' desires. Dwarves can be pretty whimsical. As much of your time is spent issuing commands as it is finding out why, say, your undertaker is getting drunk and fishing rather than burying a corpse rotting away in his dormitory. He's probably depressed. It's almost always depression. You're isolated by interface. The manner in which you direct the dwarves is arcane. Now, arcane is an overused word in video game criticism. It's commonly invoked to describe mysterious inventory implementation or if a developer chooses the wrong F key for quick save. It is so arcane, a journalist might well exclaim about an unfortunately placed jump button. What they mean when they say that is this behavior is slightly different from the norm, slightly different from what I expect. And those cowardly motherfuckers have no place playing Dwarf Fortress, whose interface is the correct definition of arcane. It requires secret knowledge to be understood. That knowledge is impossible to find out by trial and error, the usual way we learn games, and it must be decoded from wikis and readmes and community-created tutorials. You fight the interface at every turn. Control flits between keyboard and mouse, apparently at random, and the purpose of each key changes from screen to screen. To play Dwarf Fortress, and by play I mean execute even one command successfully, to consider an action and have it play out on screen is an achievement that makes people who know Dwarf Fortress gasp in awe. And finally, crucially, you're isolated by the aesthetic. Everything in Dwarf Fortress is shown through an ASCII cipher. The letters and numbers you might find in a word processor arrayed on a regular grid. There are no graphics at all, which means manually translating each on-screen symbol block by block into something you can understand. A smiley face, that smiley face, that's a dwarf. A blue tilde sign, a squiggle, 
that's a section of river. A green apostrophe, that's a patch of grass until it's stained with blood. And then it becomes a red apostrophe and it stays, rain, stays red until the rain washes the blood away. Each of those three points means that Dwarf Fortress is all but inaccessible to the vast majority of people. Even those of us who've played, beaten and built video games our whole lives need to work ludicrously hard to arrive at a point where we can say we have experienced the game. It took me eight weeks of studying, hard studying, day and night, before I could say I could play Dwarf Fortress. And by play, I don't mean survive. It meant being able to load the game, issue some rudimentary commands to my dwarves, and soon to read their grim deaths, to visualise their cold corpses buried in muddy holes in the ground. But the way the game isolates the player and forces them to learn a new language is also its biggest triumph. First, you begin as an observer, your experience shrouded in this kind of ASCII fog. But when that fog finally lifts, you find the world beneath is entirely yours. When I see those symbols, the smiley face, the tilde, the squiggle, I don't read them as symbols anymore, any more than you hear these words as loose collections of letters. Those symbols, they are the grass, the blood, the rain, my dwarf, my queen. She bites her lip. She wants to say, I know, I know, I already know. There are no missions in Dwarf Fortress, just stories you write yourself, tales that cascade from the systems you create. It is your job, your only job, to keep the dwarves alive for as long as possible, to spin these plates before they fall. Your fortress becomes larger and larger, and eventually the friction between the tiny components in your intricate design, they throw up sparks, literal and metaphorical and soon things burn out of control. To fan the flames, the game's official motto is, losing is fun. Dwarf Fortress throws problems at you as you progress. Goblin invasions, food shortages, harsh weather, dragons. When your fortress reaches a certain size, it attracts the attention of dwarven royalty who move in and when they do, they start issuing production laws. A small part of the screen shows a t constantly scrolling text box which describes the things that are going on around you. It serves kind of the game's inner monologue and it informs you of important events, of deaths, of births, of marriages and so on. When the royalty arrive, it keeps you informed of their demands. It tells you what they want. The queen insists you cease production of glass immediately. The king decrees you must produce cutlery carved from tiger bone. These demands, constantly changing, they stretch your resources to the limit. But you obey them because that's the game. It's part of your story. So, I loved and I hated my king and queen just as the game intended, right up until the day the goblins attacked and everything changed. By chance, the invasion caught the king drunk and fishing just outside the castle walls. As soon as he saw them, he knew, he knew. He rose to his feet and an arrow struck him in the chest. Two stumbling steps towards the drawbridge and the goblins, goblins were on him, swarming, slashing, turning the land from green to red. Just moments later, the guards stormed from the gates and slaughtered the goblins, too late. And then within the hour, the knock on the door, the knock on the door came. The queen sank to the floor. Her scream echoed and something happened. I don't know if it was by accident or design. 
Dwarf Fortress is full of hundreds of bugs, which means sometimes it's difficult to tell glitches from features, and there lies some of the game's humanity. But no sooner had the old king been buried than at the edge of the map, another king and queen appeared. Noting that my thriving fortress had lost its ruler, the game gave me a new one. And at first I was delighted. I built a new royal bedroom. I decorated it with the plushest furnishings and soon my new rulers made themselves at home. Then they too began issuing demands as dwarven royalty is code born to do. Coexisting, but never communicating with the old queen, my queen, a near silent shadow. I watched her ghost, I watched her ghost around the fortress, drifting through fields, picking flowers, heading to her husband's grave. She sat alone in the dining hall for hours and hours and she too would issue demands. Make weapons from goblin bone, lots of them, all of them. The trouble with vengeance is that it always comes too late. She was a living scar and every time I glimpsed her around the fortress, my conscience twitched. Could I have saved her? Could things have been different? It troubled me, but what troubled me more was this. My fortress could barely cope with the production demands of two royals, let alone three. I watched our food reserves dwindle. I saw our army stretch to breaking point. Camp-wide disease and depression crept in, nestled next to the overworked dwarves as they slept. Tempers flared, sparks started to fly, and I knew how this story was coming to a close. But I'd worked so hard for this, late into the night, and to think it was all going to collapse because of one stray arrow, one sad queen, and there was nothing I could do, except. You can't remove citizens from Dwarf Fortress. There's no simple clinical delete unit button. No lemming style self-destruct suicide. You cannot tell your dwarves to kill themselves. But you can kill them. Not directly, not easily, but there are ways, arcane ways. So it was I resolved to build a drowning chamber. I designed a room, a small, simple room, three tiles by three, close to my cemetery. Outside the room there would be three buttons. The first button would lock the door and seal the victim inside. The second button would fill that room with water tight to the ceiling. The third button opened a grate at the bottom to drain the room. That would allow me to remove the body, her body. The drowning room could not be constructed overnight. It would take some months in my stretched fortress, over half a year of game time in fact, time that weighs heavily on the curator of a murder. I did my best to avoid her gaze, but now my queen was everywhere, drifting aimlessly, always reminding me. Sometimes she'd wander past the construction site. What's that? She'd murmur half-heartedly, but she knew, she knew. Just like she knew the knock was coming, she knew. It was three months into construction that I realized this wasn't how the story could end. I couldn't bundle my queen into a room, drown her, have the rest of her people move on with their lives as if this was somehow normal. Even though she'd submit willingly, even though she saw no future and craved nothing more than death, this wasn't right. So, I wrote a new ending. I retrieved some obsidian, one of the rarest types of stone in the game and almost invaluable in my current location. I'd been saving it to craft into something special and this was that, that thing. I ordered my finest artisan to sculpt a statue of the old king and I stood that statue right in the center of the drowning chamber. I moved the second switch, the button that would fill the room with water inside the room, and I placed that switch on the statue's hand. And here was what was going to happen. One morning, one bright and sunny morning, 
my queen would wake as usual and walk to the cemetery. There she would remove her wedding ring and she would place it on her husband's grave. She would give the headstone a gentle kiss. And finally, free of burden, casting off the weight of that scream, she would walk to the chamber that I had built. Inside the chamber, she would stand in front of the statue of her husband and she would look him in the eye. She would remember the plans they had made for this place, their home. She would think about her life before that scream and know that the past really did exist, that even the, if the story, their story was over, it had been told and that that was enough. And she would smile, she would finally smile. She wouldn't hear the door lock behind her, she wouldn't care. She'd close her eyes, she'd embrace the statue and she'd place her hand on his. And then, so, construction is finished and the morning arrives. It is bright and sunny and my queen wakes and it should be clear right now, even now, that I am still talking myself into doing this. But I am almost, almost at peace with my decision and the fortress is in trouble, so something must be done. The statue is hauled into place and the queen heads from the graveyard to the chamber. She walks into the room and I tell another dwarf to lock the door behind her. He runs away immediately afterwards. It is as if he knows. And there, looking down on this three by three grid that represents love, death, the beginning and the end, I wait for my queen, the queen, to push the button. She doesn't push the button. She's thinking. She's still thinking. Why is she still thinking? And then suddenly I see it. There are two people in the room. She's not alone. Stop, stop, something's gone wrong. My eyes tick instinctively to the status messages at the top of the screen as I try to work out what's going on. And this is what I read. The queen has given birth to a baby girl. It's impossible. That's impossible, I think. She's been alone since the king died and he died like, what is it, nine months ago? Holy shit. She can't do it. I can't do it. Three months of game time later, the sparks, metaphorical and all too literal, rage out of control and the fortress burns to the ground. Everyone inside dies. The new queen, the old queen, her three month old daughter, everyone. There's nothing I could have done, I tell myself, as I glance at the time, 3 a.m. now, and then down to my computer's off switch. I stand up, I push the button and all the plans I have made, the stories I have written, dissolve once more to nothing. The end. Thank you. So I promise that is relevant. That slide thing seems to have gone off. Can we get it back? I don't know if it's my fault, whether this is timed out whether I need to put this on. Hold on one second, guys. It's disabled. I think the uh, whole thing is timed out. Roguelike notes. Check its word. Oh, that's what's that? Chrome help. Welcome to the Chrome. Tooltip. 
help sensor. Images for presentation window. Okay. Oh, Queen cover. Three of three. Okay. Chrome so help. So I need to hit play, and then we should be ready. Games now presentation. That was Taylor Swift, by the way. Presentation viewer window. She's not a roguelike yet. Okay, so where are we? Um, so, games now. Contemporary issues in video games. Uh, this is a young industry, right? This is really, really exciting. We've been going for 40 years, maybe, something like that, 30 years. Properly, 20 years, 10 years, things get serious. The reason it's hard to define how old the industry is is because everything is changing all the time. And like I said at the start, I have watched video games change completely in my lifetime. You guys will do the same. That's kind of like the problem with studying video games, is that everything you learn now will be out of date in 10 years' time. It's not true, but a lot of things will be. It's not like studying one of those easy courses like history or mathematics, where everything's already written. Everyone already knows how to add up. You know, you're not going to discover that again. History has already been written. It's happened. Video games, we are all right at the forefront and discovering things all of the time. The truth is, video games are quite a fashion-based right industry. Not exactly like that, but not hugely far away either. What always attracted me to games was that this is not a science, that everything has not been discovered, that this is an art, this is a vessel. Like any other medium, it's a thing, a container, in which you place whatever you want just like those designers have done there. And they're telling a story maybe, I don't know what that story is, but it exists. From the earliest days, that's been the same. Like the, from the earliest days, we have been like following these trends, following fashions. One game breaks through, and then for whatever reason, for whatever happens next, we have a dozen games all the same. You've seen Flappy Bird, you've seen all the Flappy Bird clones, you've seen uh, the uh, new game that the guy did, the Copter game. Within the same day, there were about 30 games exactly the same. That's kind of an extreme example of trending. I'm more interested in the glacial trends that sweep over the industry as we learn to be able to do new things, or as new things become fashionable. Sometimes those fashions happen because technology and circumstance allows us to do something new. There was a time in the late, uh, in the early 90s, sorry. Right arrow. When everything seemed to be a licensed platform game. That's Robocop, but you could take any 90s, early 90s film franchise and you'd be able to find a sprite-based platform game like that. And at the start, it was very exciting. My god, can you imagine playing a game where you are Robocop? That's really exciting to the games industry. And then slowly we got weary of it, and by the end it was like, my god, uh, Robocop 3, it's the same thing over and over again. It's a trend. It blooms up, and it, blooms, it dies away again. Another one from the early 90s, right first-person shooters. For a slightly different ra reason, id Software and John Carmack blazed this trail, invented amazing new technology that put us in the world. No longer were we having to explore these worlds with sort of flick screen, go p forward one pace, turn left, go forward one pace. Instead, we could move around with absolute fluidity and shoot things in the face. And that was really, really exciting to me as a teenager at the time and to the rest of the world and to every publisher who saw how much money that game was making. And suddenly, every game, everyone had to have a first-person shooter. So you have this sort of, um, this sort of mass of first-person shooters existing there and basically perpetuating forever. So that's a trend that stayed with us. Right arrow. MMOs. Because suddenly we were all able to connect to the internet, like clearly that was uh, what changed this game. Uh, suddenly we, able, we, we, we were all able to play EverQuest. EverQuest wasn't the first, but it was the one that used 3D graphics in a way that people could cling to, and it just swept over the world. Then everyone's portfolio had to have an MMO in the same way as right now. Right era. Everyone's portfolio, every game publisher's portfolio has to have a MOBA, has to. If your game isn't a MOBA, people aren't interested in signing it these days, because these are the things that are making a lot of money. You find that this is not unique to us. We're seeing a lot of this trending right now because we're a new emerging medium, as I said. But actually, 
all mediums have always been shaped by technology. Technology has shaped, the, shaped content. People like, who are game designers like to think that they are putting, they, you know, this is a completely blank sheet of paper. But even a blank sheet of paper is rigidly defined by the outside. You can't colour in the outside or you're going on the table. You have boundaries. Like those boundaries have existed in other forms too. Right arrow. Oh, there's VR as well at the moment. <laughs> Total trending. Right arrow. Boundaries in other uh, mediums. As soon as the printing press was invented in the 16th century, 15th century, it changed how we tell stories in literature because the novel became a thing that we could send out books, became a thing that people could actually buy and read and you know, suddenly publishing was an industry. It wasn't that suddenly we had these stories. Stories had already, already existed, but that became the popular form. Look at albums on records at the same time. Records were um, originally limited to 44 minutes. So that's how long albums were. It wasn't that musicians were like, oh, I've got a great idea for an album, it's 43 minutes long. They knew they could only put it there. Moreover, that is a medium where you have to turn it over halfway through. So you used to find that albums would start with quite poppy singles, then tracks three or four, they'd go into ballads. Then at the start of side two, you'd get another hit. And that persists today, even though that limitation is gone. Now we're working with CDs. But it's not always technology that shapes what we do. Sometimes trends just come from nowhere. Right arrow. I lied about Taylor Swift not being in it. She totally is. So um, right now we're in the middle, or sort of at the back end of an 80s revival. And no one can quite explain why. It's like a product of fashion and music and everything. You know, you find it in video games. Look at um, Hotline Miami. Is product of that 80s revival. The 80s are cool. VHS tapes are cool. No one would have thought that before. And no one can quite explain why the 80s suddenly happened. Like cool people started playing it and then, uh, so, sorry, cool people started wearing that sort of thing, maybe listening to that music. People like, I haven't heard this for 30 years. Sometimes these things just crop up and they're all sort of inexplicable. Taylor Swift's new album, 1989, out in October. Um, right arrow. Crafting is a good example of something that came from kind of nowhere, right? And it's easy to see why it's cool. It makes collectibles worthwhile. Almost the biggest, tre the biggest trending thing at like the end of the 2000s, maybe mid 2000s was collectibles. Every game had loads of collectibles, just picking up coins and red gems and blue gems and green gems to no real end. Like it was all kind of pointless. And then Minecraft came along and was like, Hey guys, why don't you craft all of those into things to make another type of gem or whatever else, you know, to make a fireplace? And everyone's like, that's fun. And soon every game had to have crafting in. Every game has to have crafting in. It's a trend. Designers like it because it's a new system. Money men like it because two and a half billion dollars. Right arrow. Running. Bit similar to the Flappy Bird thing. Cannabolt came along, showed that running is a really, really easy thing, but that's not a new mechanic. Like running in games, like single button games, running games have existed for years. I used to play a helicopter one on the BBC Micro and on the Spectrum where you did nothing other than change the height of the helicopter. But Cannabolt came along, recontextualized it, partly for a new technology. And then Temple Run took that, gave it friendlier graphics, tried to be less cool. But you've got loads and loads of running games. They're they trended, I would say, a couple of years ago. Right arrow. Recharging health bars is one for the designer, like as a mechanic. First person shooters were reinvented by this game, Halo, in 2000, 2001. Um, and the way Halo did it was with the health bar up there. For years, since Doom, uh, before that, all that happened in first person shooters was you killed things, and then, um, and then you lost health, and then you replenished health by collecting power packs, medic packs here, and you're back there. Halo changed that dynamic completely by having a health bar that recharges when you're safe, and everyone loved it. And it wasn't the thing that made Halo sell billions of copies, but it was part of that, and soon everyone was putting that little system in their game. Super important, I think. And finally, right arrow. it's a roguelikes. There's a question mark there because I wasn't sure what image to put up. 
because there are loads and loads and loads of roguelikes available today. There's roguelike, um, there's a roguelike tag on Steam, there are roguelike blogs, there are roguelike um, uh, uh, jams, there's a, uh, yeah, a roguelike jam. And it seemed misleading to put any single game up there to show you what a roguelike is, which is kind of the problem, I think. So to understand what we mean, what I mean by a roguelike, first we have to understand rogue. Right arrow. That's not rogue. Uh, right rogue. arrow. So who knows rogue? Who in this room is aware of rogue? So maybe about a quarter of you. Which is like kind of surprising when you consider how it's a game, it's the only game as far as I can tell, that has a whole genre named after it. And my, I, I thought this instinctively, and my exhaustive research came by going to genres of games on Wikipedia and scrolling down through every single thing. Isn't another game name-checked on there apart from Rogue? So that's massive, right? Tetris. No genre called Tetris-like. You call them puzzle games. Uh, Minecraft. Minecraft-like? No, you call it crafting games, maybe, or... Uh, Rogue is, is the only one that's done that. So a little bit about Rogue, some, some basic facts. I'm not going to just read out the Wikipedia page on it, because you can all do that. Developed by Michael Toy and Glenn Wichman in 1980 at the University of California, Santa Cruz, 34 years ago. Right arrow. That's ages ago. That's like a really long. Is anyone in this room? Hands up if you're in this room and you're older than 30. Yeah, so about a quarter of you. It's weird how those two things mix together. Um, yeah, it was initially uh, developed for the Unix system, and it actually got its first popular break, I think, by being distributed with BSD Unix. It's ported to the PC in 1984, and by 88, it existed on all modern formats. And by modern, I mean things like the Commodore 64, the Spectrum, and the Amstrad. This is my favourite quote and why it's still astounding that you guys haven't heard of it. Dennis Ritchie, who is the creator of C, right, the language, and Unix, so he's kind of a big deal in nerd circles, he said that Rogue wasted more CPU time than anything else in history. So if any of you guys go on to make a game that does that, it's pretty impressive. Anyway, there are plenty of places you can go to read more about how Rogue was developed. I recommend um, Edge's Making Of, uh, which you can read online. But some brief facts about what you do in Rogue. Right arrow. So, it's a D&D &D game, right? Dungeons and Dragons, and we all know those. We've played lots and lots of them. You fight stuff. That's basically the aim of Dungeons and Dragons. Explore a dungeon, crawl a dungeon, and kill monsters. The objective in Rogue is to retrieve the amulet of Yendor. No one gives a shit about video game stories. That's a good lesson to learn. But retrieve the amulet of Yendor. Yendor is Rodney, backwards. A little bit of trivia. The amulet of Yendor of Rodney is on level 26 of the dungeon. So you have to battle through 26 levels of dungeon. You have to get the thing, and then you have to get back up to the top again. Along the way, you find articles that help you. You find equipment, potions, magical scrolls, things that make your life better or worse. That's important. I think, interestingly, as, as we saw in the screenshot there, Rogue does not use graphics, right? It uses ASCII elements, like Dwarf Fortress, uh, to represent the player. That's kind of important when you consider the quality of it. It also made the game, porting the game, much, much easier, one assumes. So all of that sounds like a typical video game, but let's talk about the, um, talk about the elements that distinguish Rogue. Right arrow. What distinguishes Rogue? The biggest element that distinguishes Rogue is procedural generation of environments. Every map of the dungeon as you descend down to level 26 is different every time. And it's not, you know, drawn with an incredibly clever algorithm. You have a series of odd-shaped rooms drawn, and then they're linked together with corridors, and sometimes corridors don't go anywhere. But it meant discovery was a big, big part of that game. And it also meant you could not learn 
how to play Rogue, really. I mean, you could learn how to get better th at it, but there was no going to a game fact. Rogue was inspired by Colossal Cave, which was an adventure game. Colossal Cave you can complete by going to game facts, which didn't exist at the time, but you know, writing into a magazine and asking how you complete it. Rogue, you can only get advice on because every, every time someone plays it, it's different. Object discovery, manipulation, and management. So basically, that means collecting things, which is super, super crucial. You can't carry everything, so you have to make decisions about what you're going to do. You learn how effective different weapons are. You learn how to use those different weapons, so you do get better at that. Better. There is one cool, cool thing that Rogue does that you don't often see in modern video games, which is in Rogue, you collect potions, and some of those potions might be a potion of strength, and some of them might be poison, which is bad, and all kinds of things like that. That's not very, very interesting. What is interesting is that those potions rename themselves on every subsequent playthrough. So even if you recognize that a magenta potion is a potion of strength the first time through the game, the next time through it might be a potion of poison or something, so you better not drink it. The only way you can find that out is a little bit trial, trial and error or maybe throwing it at a monster. Third thing, systemic object interaction. There are lots and lots of things in Rogue, and by objects I mean weapons, I mean potions, I mean scrolls, I mean monsters, all the things that the player can interact with. But they can also interact with each other. And the way that you use those things against each other allows complex solving of puzzles. Some days I might just run away from monsters to try and get down. Some day I might fight them because I'm a big, strong guy. Some day I might throw that potion at them. But you've always got to be thinking produces complex interactions very, very quickly from simple things. And finally, death is final, which is kind of a bleak thing to have on a slide, but it's true. In Rogue, when you die, it deletes your save game. I mean, there is no save game, really. You can uh, quit and save to a file, but it will, it will delete that. Like, you can't reload, which... For me, as a gamer in the 80s and 90s, was completely, I guess in the 80s, arcade mentality, it's, it's okay, but in the 90s, you just learn, okay, how do I do this? I'm going to reload, 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 eventually do it. Rogue won't let you do that. And so every decision you make in that turn-based universe counts for so much more because each decision could be the decision that leads to your death, which doesn't matter when you're on level 1 or even level 5 or maybe even level 10. But when you're on level 25 and this is the first time you've seen the Amulet of Yendor, suddenly every move counts with so much more weight because death is final. Funnily enough, those things there are pretty much key to what we're talking about today. So the roguelike is a genre of games. Right arrow. Those games are like the name suggests, like Rogue, maybe? But it's a weird one, because as well as the fact that I can't think of any other genre named after a single game, um, it also has a really, really curious definition, a sort of very specific definition in a way, almost a snobby definition. It involves some of the things on our list that we just list, listed, but it's taken from the International Roguelike Development Conference in 2008, and it's called the Berlin Convention. Right arrow. So this is what the Berlin Convention came up with to define roguelikes. On the left of the screen, we have the high value things. So these are the things that if they're in your game, that gives you sort of a, a certain high value, a number of points for it being a roguelike. And these are the low value ones. So it's good to have them in the game. It's very good to have these in the game. And the more points you get, the more chance your game is of being a roguelike. I think chance is kind of a key word there because this is a genre. Surely we should know what's in it and what isn't. It's really unsatisfying to say, yeah, OK, we're going to come up with a list of things that are going to define a roguelike and then have them not define a roguelike. But just to look at that list quickly, random environment generation we've talked about, uh, procedural is, is our point there, permadeath, turn-based. Grid-based, I mean, a point here is that um, the Berlin Convention, wait, 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 I need to find this. I think I have a quote. I don't 
Uh, the Berlin Convention was, is sort of hated by a lot of people who like roguelikes. They think it's reactionary and old and basically only defines old games. It's too restrictive. And I think that about grid-based, right? Grid-based uh, is a product of the time. It doesn't define what that genre can include. Non-modal. Non-modal means that there is only one mode throughout um, Rogue. Uh, any action you can do in any part of the game, you can do in any other part of the game. Complex. Our systems interact to make it complex. There are different solutions to problems. Resource management. You find objects, you have to discard some of them. Hack and slash. It's about killing, but what isn't? Exploration and discovery is a product of all of those things, a product specifically of random environment generation and random object placement around. The other things, the low value things, I find pretty weak. Uh, single player players. I think we can all look inside our hearts and recognize that. Tactical challenge. Of course, there's a tactical challenge. It's a turn based video game. ASCII display. You're not a roguelike if you don't express what you're doing in letters and numbers. Don't buy that. Dungeons. It sounds to me that point. And the last one, sound to me like two people really like Dungeons and Numbers, and they were just sat on the committee going, I'm not passing this unless there's dungeons in it. Uh, yeah, and numbers. Apparently, roguelikes have to involve numbers. So, what doesn't? So, uh, I present that for, um, for your information, really. I believe right arrow. that we should be doing our own definition today of a roguelike. Uh, the Alto definition or posted, it doesn't have an E in it, but it was close to working out. Uh, so, a roguelike includes procedural generation of environments, object discovery, manipulation and management, systemic object interaction, turn-based movement, and death is final, right? Now, I don't want to be too strict about this, like being playful, you know, believe in the evolution of the medium, and don't, you, you never want to be the guy who's saying, you have to include all of those things. So, for a game to qualify as a roguelike, it must include right four era. of those five things, okay? Four of the five posted things. Then it's a roguelike. Then I'm happy with you calling it a roguelike. And... I hear the cry from the audience, the murmur across it, like, that seems cruel. What if it only has three of those things? Well, guys, I've worked that out. Right here. It's a roguelike, like, okay? <laughs> That's the plan. And I'm only being like, <laughs> like, like, obviously it's funny, but I'm also sort of serious about that because you need, you need a term for it. There are a lot of roguelike likes out there at the moment. And I know people who like roguelikes who get very annoyed when you say that you like a roguelike, and they say that's not a roguelike, it's a roguelike like. You don't like a roguelike, you like a roguelike like. Um, so th that's for them, right? We we've defined it. If there are three of those things, it's a roguelike like. And, guys, if a game only manages to have two of those things in them, in there, it is. Right arrow. A roguelike like light. Like. Don't be ridiculous. Right it's arrow. It's a game with roguelike elements. <laughs> That's what two or fewer, or two or one of those things. So, those terms again. Right arrow. Procedural generation of environments. What does this mean? Right? This means that our levels are always different. It means that every player who's playing our game, our roguelike, has a different experience means that we're always exploring a new thing. And it means that we can't use cheats or maps. Seems fair enough, right? I think that seems fair enough. Some nods. Object discovery, manipulation, and management. What does that mean? It means the things that you find inside the environments cannot be predicted or learnt, but they must be managed. And that doesn't just go for objects inside the environment, or at least objects as static objects, it also goes for enemies. It means that discovery is not just about your environment, it's not just about navigating down these corridors, but it's also about the things in the environment. And not just where they're placed, but also what they do. So our discovery works on two levels. Fair enough for a roguelike, that sounds right? Yes? We're all defining this together, 
You're all going to be in the room when it says, oh, I was there at the posted definition of things. So if someone doesn't agree, well, be quiet. <laughs> Systemic object interaction. That means that while the objects interact in a simple manner, the way they are combined in close quarters produces complex behavior. So it means that you can use these things together. It means sort of like, I guess you might call that like early crafting in a sense. But really, it's simple objects producing complex behavior and multiple solutions to problems. Thinking. Oh, right arrow, not there yet. left arrow. Turn-based movement. Turn-based movement, I wasn't sure about this. This was the borderline one. But turn-based movement, I think, is crucial to rogue. Rogue would not be rogue without turn-based movement. And that's what we're trying to define here. So turn-based movement means that you always have time to think and plan, and you fail on your own terms, not because you didn't react quickly enough. So you're always thinking. That's rogue experience to me. It means that moment, as I said, on the level 10, it doesn't matter on level 15, maybe it doesn't matter, but on level 26, when you're about to get the amulet, then your turns are moving slower, and that sort of flow is crucial to rogue. Wouldn't be rogue without that. And finally, death is final. That means that there's a constant threat that your game will end, and that death is to be feared absolutely. But, Importantly, as well as to be feared, it's expected. So although you're fearing it, you don't want your game to end. You don't feel stupid for it happening to you because you know death happens to everybody. So, environment, objects, systems, turn-based, cruel. Do we agree? We're in. All right. So... What we're going to do is we're going to go through some games that are roguelikes, roguelike likes, games with roguelike elements, or maybe not at all. And we're going to see what they, where, where they qualify on our scale. First one. Right arrow. Is Diablo. Who's played Diablo? Okay, good. Roguelike or not roguelike? Nope. Not a roguelike. Not a roguelike. Interesting. Okay. That's, that's a vote of one, one versus zero. So, so far that's passing. Okay, well, we look at it. What do we do? We look at it with our posted definition. So, procedural environments. Yes, qualifies. So, we have a tick. It's one. So, we know already it's a game with roguelike elements. It's qualified. Uh, second thing, objects. There are objects in there, um, and you discover them. You manipulate them, you manage them. I would say Diablo is a game all about inventory management. You will struggle to say no to that one. Yes, two out of five. Uh, systemic object interaction. Not really. There isn't, is there? So you sort of dress up in these things. I, I, I think that's a tough call for, for Diablo. Situations arrive, but the way you deal with them is mostly by clicking on them. It's not really a thoughtful game. Turn-based movement. Is there turn-based movement in Diablo? See, this I thought was quite an interesting one when I was going through it before, because turn-based could pertain to just you press a key and then the whole world moves with you. And obviously that doesn't happen in Diablo, but certainly the earlier versions particularly, you just click and then the game takes its turn to resolve the combat. And you can then run away. So it isn't that far away. But I still think we have to say no. I think we have to say no. Is it brutal? Is death permanent? It can be, right? So I think we have to say in some modes Diablo is. So it scores three out of five, which makes it a rogue-like-like. -like. We've got another ten of these, so I'm happy to do it all on my own. I'm not. Okay. Right arrow. Doom RL. Has anyone ever played that? I hadn't either until last year. It's a phenomenal game. It's uh, Doom remade as a roguelike. And look, it's even got roguelike in the name. <laughs> so, is it a roguelike? I'm going to have to do this one myself. Procedural generation, yes. Objects in there, sort of. You collect them. Systemic interaction, not really. I'd give it half a point for both of those things. Turn-based, certainly. 
Death, permanent, permanent death, death is final, yes. So it scores four out of five, just about qualifies, which is lucky because otherwise we'd have to write to them and ask them to rename it. <laughs> that would be awkward. Okay, next up. Right arrow. Spelunky, who's played Spelunky? Okay, about maybe a third of you. All right, so Spelunky, roguelike, yes or no? Yeah. Yep, like, like. definitely. Like, like, one for a like, like, one for a roguelike. Okay, so procedural generations of maps, who knows it? I should explain a bit what these games are, shouldn't I, before I skip on, because you haven't played it. So Spelunky is a platformer, right? It's not a straight up uh, roguelike, it's a platform roguelike. That's kind of how people bill it. So you are that dude there with the hat, and these maps are all randomly generated, you've got to get to the exit. And along the way, you find objects, and those objects are interesting. You learn what those objects do. There are monsters you have to kill on the way there. It's very compact. It's beautiful. It's a lovely line between roguelike and casual, I think. So procedural generation of maps, in. Objects, in. Systems, in. In, in. Turn-based, nope, you're getting this. And death is final. Yes, Spelunky is a roguelike. Right arrow. Yes, sorry. Because, um, I don't think they are like items. They are always the same. You see a bomb? Interesting. And you see a gold bar. Gold bar you give some money. Yes. And unlike Rogue, where you have the magenta portion, which does whatever, yep, yep, you yep. don't have that kind of surprise item. You don't, you don't. I'm not sure whether our um, object discovery and management directly has to include the renaming of objects. I think uh, if you look at the strict definition according to the Alto Convention, uh, arrow. it says object discovery, manipulation, and management. And I would argue you have to do all of those in Spelunky. Would you agree? The discovery part, they are hidden, but you don't have to find out what they do. Mm. You could just clarify system, systemic objects. Yeah, systemic objects. <laughs> It's such a good design, you have to. So, to clarify systemic object interaction. Very, very small things in the game, which have very, very small rules attached to them. So, a bomb explodes in Spelunky, or gold you collect, or gloves make you stick to the wall. How those things then, or a, an arrow fires from the wall and tries to kill you. But in Spelunky, you can use that arrow to kill monsters by passing through in a different way to its intended, to, intended use. I take that that is an arguable point, but systemic behavior is the single behavior on there that's meant to make things evolve that you don't expect. And I, I would say that that's what you want to look at to see whether that's present, because stuff happens in Spelunky not just that you don't expect as the player, but that the designer doesn't expect either. And that's really popular and really important at the moment. That makes sense? Yes. Good. That mic really works. Excellent design. Right arrow. Okay, so we were at... Um, right arrow. Oh, uh, we said, we, we, we basically said Spelunky just about roguelike, maybe. It's going to the sort of panel at the end where we're going to decide. Uh, desktop Dungeons. Who's played Desktop Dungeons? Desktop Dungeons, one person's played it. It's a brilliant game, isn't it? Yeah. Amazing, phenomenal game. Uh, it's roguelike as puzzler. So Spelunky was roguelike as platformer. Desktop Dungeons is roguelike as puzzler. Um, in this, it's kind of like, who's played Minesweeper? Right, so if you imagine Minesweeper as a roguelike, that's what this is. So you're gonna answer my questions. Uh, procedural generation of maps? Definitely. Objects? Yeah. Management and I think just about, <laughs> there's your mic. Oh. Yes. Systemic interaction. Kind of, yeah. Uh, I, yeah, it's, I think just about, maybe not, but even so. It's going to get five or four. Uh, Turn-based. Yes. And uh, death is final. Yeah. Yes, okay, cool. Right arrow. FTL, who's played FTL? A lot of people, not surprised. FTL, incredibly hip space opera as, um, as roguelike. Um, really interesting one to look at here. I don't have the answers to this. Uh, 
Because FTL is not a thing that people argue about when they say roguelike. Like, people say that is a roguelike. But I look at that game and I think, is it? Is it? I don't know. Thankfully, we've designed a convention today that tells us that, and then we can all be completely sure. So, you need to get angry about it. You were in the room when it was decided. Could have raised an issue. It's passed now. It's gone. Okay, so, procedural generation of levels. It's there, isn't it? It's there. Yes. No? What? Okay, but it's randomized. It has randomness. Yeah. I can see that at some point we're going to have to define, we're going to have to be tighter on that first thing. We're going to have to look at what procedural and random, how those things. Why, why would you say it's not procedural? There are random events and there are different ships that attack you. Sure, but it's, uh, it's not like you get uh, much uh, choice in how to interact with them. It, just, it basically throws you three different options that you can choose. And if you, have, if you happen to have... Uh, Interesting. I think that's a strong argument. I like it. And also, it's, uh, it certainly would fail by the Berlin because it's not modal. You go into different modes all the time as well. Some of which are kind of storytelling modes and the shops and things. So I, I don't know. I'd, I, I'd say maybe no. Objects? Well, yeah, I guess kind of you have uh, characters in your ship and... Characters yeah, and you, you upgrade have, you have your ship. Them, yeah. I think that's definitely there. Systemic interaction between those has to be there. The way those things, that throws up. So we're on two. It's already, it's already got roguelike elements. Three is uh, turn-based. Well, kind uh, of depends on the definition of turn-based. Do you know what we're finding? We're finding... Actually, looking forward to the uh, FTL because you, we defined uh, yeah. turn-based movement, yeah. which it does have. It just doesn't have uh, turn-based combat. And it also uh, almost has turn-based since you can pause it at any time. I, so I, you always have time to think. I agree. This is why I was wrestling with this one myself. I think this is very, very interesting. So I'm, I'm tempted to go with you for the no procedural level generation. I think, it, I think that's a bit iffy for this. But I think for turn base, I think it qualifies, even though the movement is fluid, which is, which is interesting, right? And is death final? So that gives it four out of five. You look really disappointed. <laughs> it's a roguelike, dude. We can't do anything about it. We've, we've done this together. OK, so it's a roguelike. Right if you want, right. every time you call it a roguelike, you can go like at the end, OK? <laughs> the Binding of Isaac, who's played this? I am so glad so many ha of you have, because I haven't really. I played it a bit, but not well enough at all to profess to be an expert on this. But thankfully, we have a room full of experts now, people who literally defined the posti al al uh, posted Alto Convention. So, procedural generation of levels. Don't be shy. Yes, one. OK. Uh, someone's so surprised they've dropped my notepad. Uh, objects in the game to pick up, find, and to locate. Yes? General nodding. Systemic interaction between these things that throw up situations you don't expect? Or is it things that you learn and it's kind of... People seem more unsure on that. Very solver from your last game. Right. I think that might be a no, judging on my minimal experience. Turn-based? It ain't turn-based, is it? Death is final and brutal. Yes. So we have three out of five, which means it is a roguelike-like. OK. Right arrow. Don't starve. Who's played Don't Starve? Yeah, you're all indie hipsters. Of course you have. <laughs> <laughs> right. Don't starve. Uh, so sorry, I should have said Binding of Isaac, to those of you who didn't know, that was a twin-stick shooter, does... Um, does uh, a, a, a roguelike. Don't Starve is kind of Tim Burton, Minecrafty. does, eh, it's, it's sort of a bit grindy. It's hard to define, but it's lucky because we've got a new convention to define things. So, procedural map generation. Yes, in, in, in Don't Starve. Objects. Yes, it's all about objects. Don't Starve is a game entirely about discovery. Um, uh, systemic um, behavior. 
like, does the game throw up things that we don't expect when objects interact? Do bees chase cows? Do you end up going down wormholes? I don't know. I think, it, I, I think that's a no. Turn-based? Not turn-based. Death is final. You got a question? As turn-based, that's interesting. It's a long term. Good, good, good call. I say that that isn't a turn. It's an environmental change, but I like it. Uh, and death is final. It kind of is and it kind of isn't. You sort of reboot in the same world. Anyway, I'm calling it a roguelike. And if uh, uh, sorry, roguelike like. And if anyone else wants to challenge me, please do. Oh, we've got a good one coming up now. Right arrow. Rogue legacy. Who's played Rogue Legacy? Right, quite a lot of you. Rogue Legacy is another platform game meets a roguelike. And, as you can tell, it's got rogue in the name, which should make it easy for us if we were lazy. But we're not lazy, we're excellent. And we're going to have a look at uh, what it is. So it does have procedural generation in the levels. Every time you play it, it's different. So that's a tick. I can't fault them on that. There aren't really objects in the levels, apart from just basic platform style pick em up, pick, pick ups, things like that. There are perks that you choose to take at the start of every level, but even those are just a kind of bonus to your character, and they're not very interesting. In fact, they're more annoying. Is it systemic? Are there objects that systemically interact to throw up weird situations? No more than, say, Castlevania. Yep. Yeah. Those, what, those are what I meant by perks. So those are just all... They, they do, but only in the way p picking up, say, a um, potion that rever reverses your controls in an annoying platformer might do. So I think they're no different to just basic objects. And they certainly don't cross-pollinate in an interesting way. You can only use them in one way. So I would say no on that. It's certainly not turn-based either. Um, and is death final? It is but you exist in the same world. This is all about, like, um, Rogue Legacy is a game entirely about grinding. Indeed, one, a friend of a friend said on Twitter yesterday, conveniently, turns out people like grinding. You can make a subpar game, really polish your grinding mechanic, and it'll work. I would argue Rogue Legacy is not a great game. I think it's a weak platformer. And I think it has um, a very polished grinding mechanic that hooks you in, which is no different, really, to Candy Crush hooking you. It's just as evil, if you think that's evil. And worst of all, it's called Rogue Legacy, which, as of today, is illegal. <laughs> they, they can't do that. We've proven it. So, OK. But it's all right. We're going from that to something positive. Right arrow. Has anyone played Hoplite? Best game. Like, the best game I've played this year. Hoplite is a puzzle game, um, a puzzle game roguelike, very, very tightly designed. If you want to be a game designer, play it, and look how beautifully the systems throw up amazing situations. And there are very, 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 very few things in there, but the way they combine, duck, dive, interweave, it's just gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Uh, it's for, sorry, it's for um, iOS and Android, I believe. It's certainly for Android. I'm fairly sure it's for iOS. Uh, most things are. And it's, um, yeah, it's fabulous. Anyway, I have to put those feelings to one side. Uh, levels, totally. You can see how that works. It's radically different, but it is. Object.
happens. Is it dancing game, right? Which is almost like at this point they're just drawing them Yep, uh, based. Five out of five. That's top score, pretty much. So that's definitely a roguelike. Okay, I want to. I think it's like those are all games that w have been funneled under roguelike, right? Those are all games that we know are roguelikes. I did want to check, like almost do a control on some other games as well. Right arrow. Skyrim. Is Skyrim a roguelike, according to our definition? Roguelike element.